Welcome to Capital Insight. I'm State Representative Kevin Mannix from Salem, and I'm your host for this show, which is designed to give all of us a little more insight on the doings in our capital. What's going on, who's there, what their views are, that sort of thing. Our guest today is Representative Lee Beyer from the Springfield area. He's a Democrat in the House, and we'll be having him share some of his insights with us. Welcome to Capital Insight. Thank you for having me, Kevin. One of the things people like to know about our representatives and folks in government is just a little personal view, the kind of thing you don't pick up in the newspapers unless you read a bio sketch or something. Can you tell us a little bit about where you're from, what your background is all about? Sure. Um, I'm from Springfield, and for those who don't know, that's next to Eugene. It's not Eugene. It's a community that's probably more like uh, one of the rural communities than it is uh, one of the urban centers. It's an interesting uh, uh, when you look at the area, because the people who live in Springfield have chosen to live there rather than on the other side of the river than Eugene. So it's a, a little different perspective, I think, than a lot of people from the north end of the state think sometimes. Um, so that's where I'm from. Uh, my background getting there, I've uh, lived in Springfield since 1964 when my family moved out here from Nebraska, graduated from high school there, went to the U of O and all those sorts of things, and uh, married a third generation Oregonian. And I have three kids that are there, two of them that are still in the Springfield Public Schools and one that's at the University of Oregon. So a little bit of background, fairly typical, I suspect, of people in Oregon now. Well, we have a citizen legislature, and of course that means that all of us are supposed to have a, another job, another way of making our living when we're not legislating. Uh, what do you do for a living? Okay. When I'm not doing this, which is most of the time, I work as a uh, consultant with small businesses. It's part of a community economic development program in the area. I've done that for a little over a decade, and so I spend a lot of time with a lot of small businesses, helping them resolve their problems, whether those are traditional business problems like financing or dealing with personnel issues, or on the other hand, uh, doing some advocacy for, for them with government agencies about regulations. It's, it's a good background. It's interesting. It's uh, an important issue in my area. Springfield's a traditional timber town. Uh, although we're fast losing that and changing, and we're one of those areas that's, that's been hard hit by the owl controversy and the lack of public timber. So one of the real important issues for me and for my constituents is job creation. Well now, in terms of this job as a consultant, it sounds like you're self-employed, so you're, are you fairly independent in that? Actually, I work with a program that was started uh, by the city of Eugene and the Eugene Chamber of Commerce to support that. So it's supported by a mix of resources. I'm, I'm not self-employed doing that, but it's an odd job and it's supported by a bunch of other people, but I have very little to do directly with government. It's mainly focused on working with businesses and helping them create jobs. That's kind of the theory behind it. I'm curious, you mentioned that uh, you went to the University of Oregon. What kind of a major did you have there? Um, in administration is what I came out. I started in uh, coming back out of the Air Force. I was uh, started out as a journalism, dual major in journalism and uh, political science. Uh, did that for three years and decided I didn't want to do that anymore and switched over and got a degree. Took a lot of courses in the business school and came out with a degree in business. Now you let slip that you were in the Air Force. Can you tell us a I little did. about that? <laughs> Well, um, my time is the time of the Vietnam War, and uh, most young men at that time were making a choice where they want to go, and my choice was to do four years in the Air Force, so a little less than four years, actually. I left here and spent some time, and uh, spent most of my time in Nevada, in the desert at an Air Force uh, radar station there. Uh, also spent some time in Texas and Mississippi, and about uh, half a year in Japan. It was a nice, nice, uh, period of time to spend around. I did not serve directly in Vietnam, but uh, had a lot of my friends who did, and uh, you couldn't be in the military at that time without being real familiar with that military uh, excursion that we had there, policing action. Uh, different period of time. I uh, wouldn't want to do it again, but it was a good, good thing to have gone through. I think it gave me a real good sense of, uh, of what government was about. And did, you meet, oh. <laughs> did you meet your wife in Springfield? I did. My wife was a, a friend of my sister's and actually met her while I was in the, uh, was in the Air Force and uh, we were married just before, I, about a year before I got out. So how long have you been married now? Uh, just almost 26 years. Well, you look a lot younger than that. <laughs> 
Thank you. Well, <laughs> I don't feel younger than that. Well, as a, as a husband of 26 years, in, in terms of your experience and everything, what made you decide, was this your third term now or your second term? It's actually my second full term, second election. I was appointed uh, to a vacancy right after the 91 session. So I've served in two interims, and this is my second full session. Well, what made you decide to go for a job, well, a position in the legislature as a representative? Um, strange as it seems, I was actually asked to apply for the job uh, rather than seeking it out. I had sp spent six years on the Springfield City Council and eight years before that on the City Planning Commission and um, Budget Committee for part of that time. I had been asked a number of times before that and had always said, no, I have enough trouble serving with five other elected officials, what would I ever do with 90? I was right, <laughs> but I got into it and uh, I was asked to and uh, I, I'm glad I did. It's been enjoyable since then. Different set of issues than you deal with on the local level, but I think my experience in local government, again an unpaid position, um, kind of gets you to the point where you have an appreciation for the different levels of government. Well, Lee, I'm, I'm curious, too, now, in terms of your arrangements during session, those of us who happen to represent the Salem area have mm -hmm. an easy time of it. I mean, we work near where we live, but do you come up here during the week, or do you commute? How do you come up for session every week? I'm actually commuting. It's about an hour each way for me every day, and uh, sometimes I wish I, I didn't have to, but I have young children still in school, and I choose not to uh, be away from them. Do you have to do some work on the weekends, or have you been able to pull away from your, your private sector job uh, while you're here? I'm fortunate in that I can pull away from that during the term, and working for another for an employer rather than for myself. I don't have to go through the, uh, the hassles of trying to maintain a business. That's, that's fortunate. I'm, I'm not sure how you do it with a law practice, um, but I essentially just leave my, my regular job. I'm, I'm off salary there. I'm off benefits and I'm living on what the state provides me. It cost me money. I figured out in the 93 session, in terms of lost income, it cost me about uh, five, $6,000 to be a legislator. Well, I'm glad you mentioned that because uh, although legislators do get paid a salary of a little over $1,000 a month, mm -hmm. and during session, uh, we get a per diem for expenses of $75 a day. Once you uh, figure in your commuting expense and the cost of your meals away every day, um, I imagine that uh, there's, there's not a lot of leeway there. And of course, for many legislators, they also have to, if they're further away, they have to get lodging, uh, right. either an apartment or stay in a hotel while they're here. And uh, I guess sometimes folks overlook that, and, uh, you, and people will extrapolate thinking you get a per diem every, you know, every day for two years. You only get the per diem when you're on duty right. during session. Well, as far as that goes, do you see that as having created some problems in recruiting people to run for the legislature, or do you think we can still get by and, uh, and maintain that citizen legislature with people who have outside jobs? Uh, I think it's a little bit of a problem, although I wouldn't say that it's a primary problem of getting people. I think the, uh, the, the money's an issue. Um, probably, you know, we've, we've heard a lot of talk around the Capitol different times about term limits. Uh, I'm just thinking to myself, I couldn't see staying in that job very long because it cost you money. There's some rewards in being involved in the public policy formation. And you, you do, I think the only reason you do it is you get a sense that you can have some involvement and get some things done. Uh, but that wears thin financially as you get a little older. Uh, I don't know how you do it. I, I think we're at a time when it's tough for a young person to be involved. I, I wonder if we won't be moving more towards people who are retired to do the job. You lose a little bit with that. But I think the bigger issue in terms of getting quality people is just uh, we're at a time where there's a lot of disagreement about uh, public policy. And we move, I think we've moved out of the sort of the, the polite discussions and debates, recognizing that it's, it's OK to have differences of opinion. In fact, that's working through those is how you get to better law and better policy mm -hmm. to a time when we're starting to beat on each other and, and taking radical positions. And I think that's, more than anything else, I think that's causing people to pull back and pull out. Let me pause for a moment and mention to our audience that you're with us on Capital Insight. I'm State Representative Kevin Mannix from Salem, and I'm your host for this show. Our guest today is Representative Lee Beyer from the Springfield area. Um, Lee is a fellow Democrat in the House of Representatives, and uh, with that, I'd like to mention, too, that to, and ask you about this job that you have as the Democratic Whip. 
what is the WIP? What's that all about? <laughs> the WIP, the title is more of a traditional title that comes out of, actually I think it goes back to the British Parliament, where the WIP was the, uh, the political position, if you will, that was supposed to work and keep the members in line. I think that's where the title comes from and uh, focused on a policy agenda. Our system is different than the parliamentary system, which is much more you, in essence, you're voting for people, but voting for the party. And if you don't like the way the country is going, you vote the party out, and then you change. We have a separation of powers, and, and party plays less of an importance in our system than it does in a parliamentary system. So what the WIP does in the Democratic caucus is more one of working with uh, the Democratic members, and the same is true in the Republican, uh, working with the uh, the party leader, which in our case is Peter Courtney, a Salem representative, to uh, focus an agenda, trying uh, where we agree upon things, try to keep that together, and make sure that everybody has the same amount of information and understands the bills that are coming through, and and try and uh, work with. In this case, now we have a Democratic governor to try and push that a uh, Democratic platform. As you're working on that, do you find that you need to serve as a, uh, a person who mends differences among the Democrats, or is it mainly a, a matter of ushering people along and making sure they understand what the, uh, the politics are all about? It's actually both. It's a little bit of that. It's a, it's a collaborative style that we have in trying to mend the differences within our party and bringing people along on issues and, and deciding sort of what we're going to agree upon and what we're going to disagree upon. and hopefully keeping it on friendly terms so that we can get through six months of discussion. Well, how do you feel about this session uh, compared to the last? I'm in my fourth session, so I've had a little bit of an overview. The first session I was in as a freshman with a Democratic majority in the House and Senate, my second and third sessions, and your first session, mm -hmm. uh, we had uh, the Republicans in charge of the uh, House, but the Democrats in charge of the Senate. Now we have the Republicans in charge of both the House and the Senate. Um, and uh, in terms of your perspective as WIP and as someone who served last time with a split in terms of who was in charge, how does it feel this time and what do you see as, as a difference? Well, let me start by saying I think the Democratic caucus's position, particularly in the House, I can't speak for the Senate, has been one of, um, we heard the elections in November and, and I think one of the things we heard clearly was people were very upset and tired with partisanship. So as a caucus, we have committed to trying to focus on policy decisions and not on politics. Uh, that's, that's a change, you know, in some ways, uh, trying to deal with that. So I, I think that's, uh, you've seen the first evidence in that by the fact of breaking probably tradition all the way back to statehood. You had the Democratic leader, Peter Courtney, nominating the Republican leader for Speaker of the House. That's quite unusual. It may seem symbolic and unimportant, but it, I think it truly was. Since then, we have been working with, you know, our caucuses, as you know, leadership has been working closely with the Republicans to try and uh, flesh out the issues and, and find the areas that we agree upon and move issues in a timely manner. And I think we've been successful at working with that. Tone of the session is different, and I'd be curious about your insights on it, too. Uh, last time, last time, 93 is very contentious. There was lots of fights. You had a, uh, uh, as you know, we had a, a Democratic, or Democratic Senate and Republican House, and there was lots of disagreements and, and struggles over issues. You don't have that this time. The Republicans clearly have control. I think they started out with an agenda that they wanted to move, and my perception is that they're having a little trouble doing that. Uh, they're having more trouble uh, internally in their party than they're having with the Democrats. I'm finding, at least on my committees, where sort of spending a lot of time now sort of twiddling our thumbs. It was a fast rush to get started, and now we're sort of waiting <laughs> for the bills to come down. Well, I do think mm -hmm. that there's probably, for one thing, there's a difference in methodology. If I go back to 89 when the Democrats were in charge, uh, Democrats tend to be more of a raucous, diverse group yeah. and, um, and are used to not taking as many orders from above. They're less regimented. And, of course, I'm generalizing and 
you can make mistakes when you do that. But in the general sense, my perception was that uh, we're, we are less disciplined, but we, we've, we choo choose that lifestyle in terms of our politics. And uh, that's how I can get away with being a, something of an independent-minded Democrat. I, I kid my Republican colleagues about that. I say, they say you should be a Republican. I say, no, because if I started to disagree, you're not used to disagreement in the ranks. <laughs> the Democrats are used to it. And, but in the 89 session, uh, there was a lot of free flow of ideas from the middle and lower levels of the ranks. And the Republicans were in there, too, and, and mixing in. Uh, in 91 and 93, with the Democrats in charge of the Senate and the Republicans in charge of the House, the Republican style was different. They were more used to uh, uh, a more regimented leadership style, and the House had this loose, the Senate had this looser style, and those did, didn't always mesh very well. And, and I think the, there was more of a partisan flare-up. Uh, there's probably also something to do with the personalities of individuals involved, but I think it also has to do with group dynamics. Mm. Now we've seen a shift to the Republicans in charge on both sides, and the regimentation is there where the leadership does have a lot of authority, more than the, the Democrats would tend to have in a similar circumstance, I'd say. But we seem to be seeing a situation now where within those ranks there's some divergent views among Republicans, and they're not used to having the control on both sides where they can do things if they agree. And so now they're having to figure out how to disagree politely among themselves. It's a new experience. I think that's a good observation. And, and I think we have to keep in mind that uh, both the Speaker of the House, the President of the Senate, and the majority leaders on both sides are brand new. In fact, if you go onto the Senate side, the, the two lead positions over there have only served two years in the legislature and, and really don't know what to do to control the place. And they're learning. I think they're trying hard to do that. Similarly, you're finding the same kind of thing in the House. Um, Bev Clarno hasn't been around a long time. And you know she's trying her hardest. So some of that's expected. And certainly, the chairs of the committees are going through some of that, too. Uh, so it is, it's kind of a uh, hurry up and wait. It reminds me of my military career. You, know, you always hear uh, GIs talking about hurry up and wait. That's where I think we're at now. I expect the issues will come down. But again, you're right in terms of the, the difference between, I think, the Democrats and, uh, and the Republicans is that the Democrats enjoy diversity, and we don't always agree amongst ourselves, and we very seldom uh, vote straight party tickets, although that's what you hear in the, the press a lot. Uh, that's not so true on the other side. I think they're, uh, they try real hard in their caucuses to make sure that everybody's going to vote the same. Now, we should talk a little bit about that in the context of most votes, though, because, of course, we tend to identify with some key votes that are highly contentious, where the parties have certain identification. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and yet, the vast majority of votes, you'll see a lot of crossover. And uh, there'll be a tendency of people to vote whatever way they feel like. And uh, the, 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 there isn't a lot of party discipline as to a lot of those issues. Um, maybe we should talk a little about that, because we see a lot of those votes. And uh, there'll be a lot of almost unanimity on the House floor and the Senate floor. Um, how important is that to the continuation of the process, to have those kinds of things coming down, as opposed to the, those tight votes where we're split on party lines? Well, I, you know, I think you hit it. Most of the bills, and the, the press likes to talk about the 4,000 bills that are introduced or something like that. And I, I think a piece that's often missed is that probably half of the bills that are introduced actually come out of the administration. They're by the agency personnel, and they're just really housekeeping and cleanup bills. Uh, things that change, laws that change, federal rules that change that the state has to align with, uh, differences of ideas. And most of those bills come in, they're heard, and uh, legislators, both parties sit there in committee and say, yeah, you know, that makes sense. We ought to do that, ought to make that change. And when those bills hit the floor, uh, you're going to see uh, almost unanimous votes on most of them. And, and again, as you said, that's going to be most of the issues. They're going to break on a few key policy issues. I think land use is likely to be an issue where we break on. And it's, it very easily could be sort of a east of the mountains rural versus west of the mountains urban issues on how much state involvement we should have in controlling growth, key issues there. Um, and certainly around the budget, some choices about how much we're going to put into one er what area or another. And, and on government regulation, environmental issues, there will be votes. And some of those, uh, when we get down to it, there will be some attempts, I think, to, uh, uh, at least on the Republican side, to try and hold it to a party line vote, uh, understanding that they are in charge and they are responsible for 
pushing through a budget and for adopting their agenda. Um, that's what the voters gave them, and uh, uh, there'll be a lot more partisanship because I think that's their job to be partisan. That's harder for Democrats to do, as you pointed out. We're a little more diverse than Republicans are. Well, let's pause again for a moment, and I'll mention to the audience that you're with us on Capital Insight. <coughs> I'm Representative Kevin Mannix from Salem, and I'm your host for the program. If you ever have any questions or concerns and uh, you'd like to write about them, feel free to write to me at Capital Insight, H395, State Capital, Salem, Oregon, 97310. I'd be happy to hear from you, and I'd be happy to respond to your concerns. Lee, we were just talking a little bit about the, how the bills get through and how the, the votes mm -hmm. line up. Do you see uh, any issues lining up in terms of the taxation arena? I know you're on the Revenue and School Finance Committee. Well, what do you see from that perspective? Well, I think the biggest issue that uh, most Oregonians are interested in is state funding of education. Uh, my guess, my experience from talking with people in my district is that they're real clear on what they want, adequate funding for education. Uh, they don't understand how that happens or who's responsible between the school board, local school board, and the state legislature. They just know that they want more money to go to kids, and, and that's what we're dealing with. Uh, that's probably going to be a major issue. One of the things that's uh, important in the capital and probably not thought about too much in the school district because you're only worried about yours is when we moved, when we passed ballot measure five, we really transferred the responsibilities for funding education from the local voters to the state legislature. And what that did was we have a constitutional requirement that says if the legislature is funding the schools, we are obligated to provide an equal amount of funding for every student in every school district in every corner of the state. Uh, we're not there. By having local options, we had districts spanning a range from spending $3,200 a year per student in their district to high spending districts that were spending as much as eleven dollars and $12,000 a district. Most of those were small rural districts with unique problems. In the legislature since 1991, when they first adopted a, an equalization formula, we've been trying to bring the two ends towards a standard formula with some recognitions of uniqueness, because that's the constitutional responsibility. And we're, we're apart. We're about 60% of the way towards closing the gap. And the question is going, you know, how do we do it the rest of the way? Oregon is unique. We're not unique in terms of having the what they call the equalization problem. About half of the states have that. We're unique in terms of we are the first state that has tried to close that state without using new revenue. In fact, as, as you know, we're doing it in an era where the revenue total taxation is, is shrinking. And so we've, done, uh, we've moved faster uh, than any other state has without adding new money. And we're about at the point where it's, it's going to be tough to close the, the last piece of the gap. Uh, well, let me ask you about that gap. I've heard some people argue that, well, to the extent that uh, within the 5% limitation that will now be in effect for property taxes for schools, some districts obviously still have a richer base and would have higher property taxes, and that at some point the uh, equalization ought to be simple parity. That is, you, you try to be fair to all districts, but recognize that there may still be some high property tax districts that are bringing in more money, and you let them go their own way to that extent and just try to bring the school districts within a certain range mm -hmm. uh, where there's at least X dollars per pupil, and the state funds are there for that. But after that, we don't worry about it. What do you What do you think about that? Oh, uh, I I don't think I don't think that that's legal under the Constitution. I think if you look at it like this coffee cup, our job as a legislature is to determine how big of a cup we're going to use, and the way we've done that, as we said, per student, this is the size of the cup. And what we do is we look to each district, and we start from the premise to say, if this if this cup is five thousand dollars a student. We look and say, how full does the cup get with the $5 in ta property taxes? And that's going to vary by school district. And when we're done, when that's done, in essence, what the state does is from the money that we appropriate out of the income taxes, we fill the cup. So it's going to vary in each district. And, and we don't look at it on a district basis. We decide, as the legislature, how big the cup is. Well, let me ask you a revolutionary question in light of that. If that's what we're dealing with, 
Why doesn't the state just collect the school property taxes and pour them into the same coffer and then pour the money back out on a per pupil basis and tell the school districts to do what they can? Or should we change the approach to school funding? It's interesting you bring that up. That's what happened in the 1930s when uh, Oregon citizens decided that they didn't like a statewide property tax, did away with it, and moved to an income tax. Now in 1991, what we did was, through Measure 5, is we decided we wanted to go back. And so, in effect, what we have is a $5 statewide property tax once we're fully implemented. And I, I need to be clear, we're not there yet. We have one more year of declining property taxes, and then we will be at $5 a thousand. Uh, so, in fact, we have that, but it raises different money. Well, then, but then I have to ask another revolutionary question. <laughs> Why are we allowing local school districts to make spending decisions locally, not policy decisions about administration maybe, but pay decisions and all of that, if in effect it's all state money? Well, I think the, uh, that's a good question, and it's one that's been discussed a lot in the, the Revenue Committee, State and School Finance, new name, I've got to get used to that, this time. And, and I think the question is, who best can decide how money can be spent in a local school district? So you, you would treat it more like a block grant. We've been arguing with the federal government, they should give block grants right. to the states and let us decide how best to do, say, welfare. Right. or Medicaid, and uh, instead of having all the policy making at the federal yeah. level. I don't think anybody would argue that the school needs and problems in inner city Portland are the same as the school needs and problems in John Day. They're just different. And I think uh, our system of electing local school boards, and I want to be clear, electing local school boards uh, recognize that difference and I would maintain that they're probably in a better position the local school board to know what's best to uh, how best to spend the money that they get to create a quality education than we are should we allow for differentials in cost of living and trying to determine the equity for instance I would assume the cost of educating a student in Portland is higher just because the cost of living will be higher than, say, in John Day or Klamath yeah. Falls. You know, we, we looked at that during the interim. I was on the Revenue Committee during the interim, and uh, I would have thought that, too, when I started. But as we started exploring that, you recognize that there are some unique differences. Um, when you get out in the rural areas, they have more transportation costs. There are differences with having people spread all over. The school districts are smaller. Uh, in a lot of cases, they're buying like uh, foreign language programs, buying it off the satellite from somebody else. Uh, and so, so they lose the economics unique. of yeah. scale, and yet they and have the a, negative economics of a large transportation right. system. When you get into the valley in some of the larger districts like Portland, uh, well, Portland has some unique problems that only Portland has. They are a federal desegre mandatory desegregation site, so they have that to deal with, and it's unique. No one else deals with that. But beyond that, they have some inner city crime and some inner city gang problems. Uh, other cities in the valley have similar problems, but they're not to the same extent. They also have a higher level in many of their areas of poverty and lower income students that have unique needs than we do in some of the other areas, say my district. So there, I, I guess I get back to the point of saying there are some real differences and uh, I would spend one day listening to the urban school saying, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. You probably can make a case for more money or unique needs there. Then I was, the next day I'd hear the people from the rural district and say, yeah, you make some real unique cases for that. And I finally got to the point in my own mind of saying they're just unique and there's no way I can make those decisions okay. to separate the two. I have a quick last question for you. Are you enjoying yourself as a legislator? I am enjoying it. Uh, there are times when I wonder why I do it. Uh, certainly the, uh, the physical stress is difficult to deal with, but you get a, it, there's no taking away from the fact that it's exciting to be in the Capitol when the legislature is in session. All right. Well, thank you, Lee Beyer, for being with us and for being in the legislature. And thanks to our audience for joining us on Capital Insight. We hope to see you again next time. I'm Kevin Mannix, your host, thanking Lee Beyer, our guest. Thank you, Kevin.